So I'm just gonna say a couple quick words. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so I'm Emily Fagan. I am the Director of Outreach for the BC Humanist Association. Um, and tonight's panel is on humanism and end of life. Uh, so I just wanna start by acknowledging that um, tonight I am coming to you from the ancestral and ceded homelands of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wistanic peoples, um, whose historic relationships with the land continue to this day. Uh, I am grateful for the opportunity to be coming to you from this shared territory, although I was not invited to do so. Um, so given tonight's turnout, everyone uh, except for our speakers has been muted to prevent um, just any inadvertent accidental interruptions. Uh, but during the Q&A portion, towards the end of tonight's event, feel free to throw any questions you might have in the chat. Um, and those will be moderated uh, by me. Um, and obviously be respectful to one of another and our speakers. Um, our speakers tonight include uh, Jennifer Malms, uh, and co-director of the End of Life uh, Doula Association of Canada, and Cindy Oxenberry, the president of the Memorial Society of British Columbia. We would like to thank uh, Elaine McDonald, who was originally scheduled to speak tonight um, from the End of Life Doula Association, but unfortunately uh, was unable to join us tonight. She was very helpful in consulting on our recent release guides that uh, Sophie, our director of campaigns, will be speaking out later. Um, but yes, we would just like to take a moment to acknowledge Elaine's hard work. Um, so we're recording this talk tonight and it will be released on our YouTube channel and podcast later sometime next week. So look for that if there's anything you want to go, go back and re-listen to. Um, our next special virtual event, a talk on cults by Rat Matthew Rendemski, is coming up uh, very soon on November 19th. Keep an eye on our newsletter and social media for more information on how to RSVP very soon. Um, and starting with Cindy, I'll let our panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their work in relation to end of life care and how they first got involved. Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you very much for uh, having me here tonight. I'm really thrilled to be here with Jennifer and Emily and Sophie and to talk about um, end of life and what that looks like from the perspective of the Memorial Society and what it is that we do. So if you if you don't know who we are, we are um, a, a, a secular organization. We provide um, independent information about reasonably, reasonably priced funeral services. And we promote planning well in advance of death so that um, our members, so we're a membership model, we're an advocacy organization. So members and their next of kin can move with confidence and comfort in dealing with end of life obligations. So we take a very pragmatic approach. We look at the industry of, of death care um, and the corporate side of it. And we try to make sure that individuals get what they want and what they need in whatever way they want and in whatever way they need. So that's incredibly important to us. I've been with the organization on the board for four years now, and I joined when my father died at home. And we, we thought we were, we were ready. We're like many people. We thought we were ready. We thought we knew what we were doing. And when the moment arrived, uh, 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 the moment came about when he died, we didn't actually no, we were stuck. We didn't know what to do. And having the one thing to do, which was to call the Memorial Society and say, my father has just passed away. And to have them be there and respond and answer that question and help us with just one next step. One next step. That's what we needed to do. And after that happened, I realized that this is a really valuable um, service to provide to the people of British Columbia. So we're a BC organization. There are there are, we have uh, tens of thousands of, of members uh, over the lifetime of the organization that's been around since 1964. Um, there have been over a quarter of a million members. So we provide that service to British Columbia. And I look forward to telling you more about that as we, as we talk today. Thank you so much. And Jennifer? Um, thank you, Emily. And Thank you, Cindy, for all your hard work over there at the Memorial Society. Uh, we too, at the End of Life Dual Association of Canada, support early planning and um, helping people get the experience that they desire and helping them um, 
make it unique. So we're not just cookie, you, you know, we're not cookie cutter people and uh, there shouldn't be a cookie cutter way to, to die or uh, have your funerals happen, you know, happening. Um, it's, it can be a very unique and very thought out and, and well-planned process. And that will help not just the person who is dying, but the families that are left behind. Um, for those of you who don't know what an end of life doula is, I, I recognize a few faces and I did speak uh, uh, once uh, in person to your group, uh, I think it was last year. Um, but an end of life doula is a person who helps uh, a family and an individual uh, who is facing a lifelong, life limiting illness. Uh, we help with empowering them to make choices uh, educating them on what those choices could be and encouraging them to um, really take hold of the process and be involved in the process of making informed decisions and uh, preparing space for these conversations so that uh, emotional decision making and last minute decisions aren't having to be made because once you take uh, once, once you have these conversations, you have time to really think about it. And at the last minute, there's not a lot of times. And when there's not a lot of time, your options do get narrower. Uh, the association was established in 2017 by myself and a colleague, Sarah Muxlow, who's a social worker. I got into this work um, back in the 90s. I um, had been with a few family members that had died. My family never kept me away from death. So I was very comfortable with it and I could I saw how it could be wonderful and beautiful and I saw how it could be ugly and disjointed. And uh, I went into nursing school thinking that I was going to be a nurse working in palliative care. I quickly found huge gaps and a lack of uh, education in this area, lack of awareness in this area. So I said, okay, I'm getting out of nursing school. And I went on to do a gerontology degree and focused on death and dying from Simon Fraser University. Um, so that's what, that's what I've done. And now uh, I'm seeing, I'm looking, my dog is barking, I'm sorry. Uh, narrowing it down even further, knowing that um, things will change with policy changes. So I'm now pursuing my master's in social policy from Athabascus University and it's so that we can really raise the standard of end of life care here in Canada. That's a little bit about me. Yeah, I think that's really great. Um, so I just want to give our campaigns manager, Sophie Burke, uh, the opportunity to speak a little bit to her background along with the resources and research that we've recently launched um, and why now is a critical time for me. Let's go ahead, Sophie. Yeah, um, so my personal background is in healthcare and health ethics, and I work uh, both with BC Healthless Association and Vancouver Coastal Health, doing education about um, medically assisted death and also end of life care. <clears throat> and that navigation can be really complicated for people. So providing that education is so important. Um, and the true reason why BCHA has decided to do this panel and decided to provide this education, because we really believe that everyone uh, gives meaning to their own life and is uh, deserving and uh, respectful of having uh, a death and a life that is in accordance with their values. And by providing that education, it can really make it possible for people to do so. Um, and now is such an important time to be talking about end of life issues, specifically about medically assisted dying, which is one just one component of end of life care because uh, made medically assisted dying was legalized in 2016 and now is kind of being returned to legislature for some new decisions for an update. And a few key pieces for everyone to know about that is that um, the new laws will reduce barriers. We talk a little bit about this in the blog post, but it will reduce barriers uh, like waiting periods, extraneous witnesses um, to be able to have people make that request sooner. Um, provides people with non-reasonably foreseeable death, so people living with ALS or MS, to apply. Um, and it also allows for advanced directives. And why this is so important is because it allows uh, for people who were previously ineligible to apply to submit a patient request record, and they may now be eligible for a medically assisted death should they wish that be a component of their end-of-life care. This is really why we're talking about it, and we hope that people can consider all their end-of-life options and prepare for that. Absolutely. 
Um, so our first question, uh, going to Jennifer first, um, how, has working so closely with May changed the way you see your career or other areas in your life? Uh, that's a good question. And um, when I started doing this work and when I wrote the program for um, Douglas College, I wrote the end of life doula certificate program for them, MAID wasn't on the table. Um, it was definitely um, something that I that I never thought that we would even get to. Um, and uh, when it when it came to the table, it definitely, uh, I'm not going to say it increased business, um, but it, but it uh, increased the number of conversations. It gave somebody, some people something to talk about, um, where people weren't okay with talking about death and dying before, but here's a topic on the table and people want to make an opinion, whether it's I support it or I don't support it or I want to know more about it. So when uh, medical assistance in dying came into play in June of 2016, I definitely uh, had way more conversations about death and dying. It was like the door had opened just a little bit. Um, not so much that everybody wanted to choose it or people were like, you know, really interested in it in that sense. It's just, it was, it was something to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Cindy, how about yourself? We, uh, so we don't, we don't take a position. We, we want to support anybody who uh, wants to do advanced planning and we want to support people around doing, I, I think it's interesting sort of the, all of our different perspectives and they do all come together and it's really about supporting people to do what they, what they want to do in the way they want to do it, in the way they want to either leave this life um, the way they want. We're, we're about planning and what happens sort of at the point of death, but also afterwards as well. We have more discussions. I think I would agree with Jennifer that there are maybe more discussions and that there's been a heightened awareness around the, if, if there's an ability to plan something, right, then I think a lot more people are interested in planning that. And so that probably has made a difference. Um, anytime we can get people having the conversation and becoming more comfortable with the topic, they're going to be looking at the kinds of services that we can be providing. So we're really, and we like to encourage people to have those conversations. I can't say that we, that there was a very specific impact for us. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so starting this time with Cindy, my next question is, uh, in your experience, um, what impact has the legalization of MAID in Canada had since the policy was enacted? So just ways that you've seen it impact communities. Yeah, um, I think that, again, there's more conversations going on, for sure. And I think the services around it, there's definitely more attention around what kind of services do we need to be putting in place. But again, from our perspective, we're not really at that. We're not really sort of at that um, uh, sort of connection point around it and the people that we work with, we often don't necessarily know what kinds of plans they've made or whether it's something that they're considering, whether it's on their radar. Uh, we just know that there are people that are interested in planning in advance and ensuring that um, there's, a, there's the advocacy perspective from a consumer perspective for us, right? To ensure that people are comfortable with what it is they have planned and that they have everything in place and the people that need to know uh, what they want to have happen, that that information is available. And that's another one of the services that we provide to members. They can come to us and they can say, and this is where it becomes very um, incredibly um, valuable when it comes to MAID, is that they can come to us and say, uh, put on file what it is they want to have happen and be really specific about it or be as general as they want. But if there is something that they want to have happen, they can come to us and put that on file. And then we'll make sure that it's available to the family when the time comes so that there's no, there aren't discussions, there aren't arguments, there isn't any conflict around that kind of thing. Because I think, again, around the planning, um, the, the last thing you want to do is create problems for your family, problems for your friends. And, and so being able to be really clear about your, your, your wishes is important, but also to make sure that everybody has access to that as well. Yeah, 100%. Uh, what about you, Jennifer? Have you seen an impact since legalization? 
Um, yes, I definitely have seen an impact. And um, at first, uh, I'm just going to share a little bit of uh, experience that uh, that I have found. Um, at first, when it was rolled out, I I'm not sure if if it was rolled out in in a in a way that was thoughtful of all of the um, pieces that fit. Um, so what I was finding it was that uh, nurses and doctors weren't sure if they could opt out or opt in. Um, so there was some some miscommunication there. I I know that. Um, there was a lack of grief support for this type of uh, death. I mean, this is a very unique type of death and families weren't all in agreement. You, you, you hear the stories of, of, you know, everybody's gathered around the, the bed or the sofa or, or whatever and uh, a maid is administered and the family is happy and everybody's good, but then there's, there's the brother in the hallway or the brother that's left because they're angry and they don't, they couldn't understand why uh, somebody would choose this. So I don't know if there was enough supports around that piece. Now, that being said, there have been some initiatives made since it rolled out. So nurses are a and doctors and pharmacists are able to opt in or opt out. They're not forced into it. Uh, I know there's still some controversy about um, having it occur in hospice. And um, what I like to tell people to think about if they're angry about that is that hospices were actually developed by churches. They were run by nuns. So I always, I, I'm one of those people who likes to look at both sides. It's whose, whose rights do you infringe on? Do you infringe on the person who wants to have made or do you infringe on the people who set up the, the, the home? Um, so there was that and, and uh, there has been some changes to that as well. And there is uh, good grief support through a, the website uh, Bridge C14, which is a grief and bereavement resource specifically for people whose, fa whose family member or friend has chosen medical assistance in dying. And, and that those things um, have definitely lessened the impact for, for sure. The negative impact, I mean, the positive impact it being that people are having a choice of um, how they want their last few moments, days, uh, or they get to pick a specific time. And um, I think that that, that is the, the biggest impact that people have choice. And, and I love when people have choice. And I just wanted to mention that the End of Life Dual Association doesn't take a stand on it either. Uh, like Cindy said, from the Memorial Society, each individual doula will choose or not choose to support uh, persons who want to um, utilize medical assistance in dying. Yeah, totally. Um, okay, so uh, as it currently stands, what do each of you see as the biggest challenges someone might face in trying to access medical assistance in dying, uh, starting with you, Jim? I think I just mentioned some of that. Um, the, the biggest barrier, I guess, is lack of uh, information and, um, and utilize, going to the right resources. And that's one thing that we do uh, with, as uh, doulas is we help find you the accurate information and the accurate resources. There are places in Canada that it's, where it's really hard to get a, a doctor to come and uh, sign off on those things um, in Vancouver and especially on the island, um, the medical assistance and dying program has been quite smooth. And uh, there are doctors and nurses and pharmacists that are willing to participate, sorry. And there are uh, witnesses that are willing to come and witness the paperwork. Whereas in some places, maybe in a small community, um, or in a, in a community that might not agree, maybe the community is quite Catholic or it could be First Nations or whatnot. It might be hard to get someone in there to uh, help out with that. Yeah, totally. Uh, what's your perspective on this, Cindy? Yeah, I think that um, 
you know, I always, I always come back to education, right? I always come back to education. What sort of resources are available? How can people understand what their options are? Um, and, and also, how can they understand what some of the challenges might be? So, so uh, speaking to what Jennifer said about the grief process, right? So is this different? In what way is it different? What do I need to do to prepare my family? What do I need to do to prepare myself? I see that as very similar to the challenges that we try to address through the Memorial Society, right? Is, is educating people, helping them understand what their options are, and that there are, a, there are any number of ways of approaching um, sort of your, your, your final wishes or your end of life, and that there's no right or wrong way. Every family, I mean, every family is gonna come at it differently. People are gonna have, People are going to have challenges negotiating that, but where do they get the support for it? So I think I, I think that echoes pretty much what Jennifer is saying around support and also around the education piece. Yeah, and what Cindy said, uh, getting it in advance. Like I think Cindy and I will be both beating the same drum. Do things in advance and know where those supports are before the process. Yeah, absolutely. Totally. So um, those in uh, end of life circles might have heard a lot about um, how someone must have the capacity to or capability to consent to a medical assisted death. What does that mean in practice? Uh, starting with Cindy. I think that's a, I think that's a Jennifer question. <laughs> I think okay. in, in terms of yeah, yeah, because that that wouldn't be something that we would be there for. But I would think that's very much Jennifer's area. Totally. All right. So, Jen. So, uh, a person needs to have the capacity to give consent right up until 10 minutes before the procedure happens. So, at the time of the request, at the time that they start uh, the 10 uh, day process, or when they make the appointment to actually uh, set the date. And the date needs to be set within the three months of doing an application. It does expire. It can get renewed, but it does expire. And I've had seen this with, with one of my clients who set a date for her birthday and didn't realize that her paperwork was expired and had to go through all the process again. Um, what, did I, what did I miss? Uh-oh, I lost it. It was consent. So. 10 minutes before, while after or around the time that uh, they are putting the IVs in, in a person uh, to uh, get ready for the drugs to be administered, they will ask again, or is this what you want? And the person needs to be able to give consent. Now, what that means in practice is that person cannot be on any pain medication at the time anything that would make them kind of loopy or not a hundred percent in capacity would uh, alter their ability to uh, give consent and the law at this point says that you need to be able to give consent and i know that that is a part of the new um, law that they're trying to push through is that you'd be able to put it in your advanced care plan and plan towards it, but at this time, that is that is not what's happening. You need to be able to give consent. And some people, because if they've been in pain and they're afraid of pain, they don't wanna feel that. And that enough will stop them from making the decision to utilize medical assistance in dying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. So we have a couple of questions each directed at each of you. So uh, we're going to start with Cindy. Um, so what are some new options for memorials and celebration of end of life services for non-religious people that didn't exist 20 years ago? Can you speak to the role of the Memorial Society as a secular institution born from the Unitarian Church in this? Yeah, uh, it's, such a, it's such an interesting question because things have changed so much. Um, what we see in terms of cremation compared to the, um, you know, even 10, 15 years ago, um, and so that really opened up a number of different opportunities for people to figure out, you know, what did they want to have happen with their remains afterwards. So we see the, the, the 
ability for someone to choose what they want to have happen is much broader than it ever was. And I think people are thinking about it much more creatively and they want to do different things um, in a, and are able to in a way that they couldn't do before. We're looking at some options that are, uh, uh, and these are, these are new, we don't necessarily have them in uh, BC yet, but things like composting, uh, uh, aquamation, uh, looking at other ways that maybe are, are easier on the environment. So that's becoming an issue now when we think about cremation and the kind of energy it takes. Uh, but there are, you can, you can, everybody does it differently and everybody does whatever they want. And I don't think that people feel as limited uh, as they might have and, and sort of felt like the only option was to go to a funeral home, maybe the funeral home that your family, you know, has gone to before. And so the options around where you might want your ashes to go uh, within reason, I mean, I think you always have to check and make sure that, that you're allowed to um, scatter ashes. But, uh, you know, the way that people end up in in gardens or in water or whatever it happens to be. Those, I think it's more, um, the possibilities are there and that's what's changed more than anything else in the last little while. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Um, so to Jen, uh, what role do families and friends play in, the make, in making someone's end of life meaningful? That's a great question and um... I think that uh, since COVID, things have definitely changed, but I see uh, an opportunity to be creative. And I think that the more a family is involved and is creating something specific and unique to that person's life that just honors that, I, I think that, that this time, even though we're separated, it can allow us to take the time and really think about how can we do this well you know making sure that we're following whatever they've designated in the will because that's where you say what to do with your body after and the executor is uh involved in that but having the time right now to really do things well um the one thing that i, I that i would uh, advise against is people are tending to put funerals off at this time um, I just uh, heard a story yesterday from someone whose aunt had died in March and they just buried her last week because of COVID and because the family couldn't get together. And in those cases, a lot of times the grief and bereavement process can't start. It's, it's unfinished business. And uh, I'm not saying that you have to get out there and do things right away, but um, I would encourage people to, to not put those those things on hold because you really do want that grieving process to start. Uh, I can share one, I, one really um, neat thing that I've seen. You know, people are, are I, I've got lots of stories if you want stories as well. Um, but one thing that I saw during COVID was a man had passed and uh, he was cremated and um, they weren't really able to, you know, to come together, but he was a hunter and he had six hunting buddies that he would go with. And they actually had his ashes put into bullets and they set separated, socially distant, separated seven seats. The last seat was his seat with his gun and in the bullets were, were his ashes. And they shot 77 uh, rounds of his ashes off because it would have been his 77th birthday. And I thought, wow, that was what a great way to honor this man's life and really work through that, you know, in a safe way um, where people can come together. And I think that this time, as bad as it is sometimes with the separation, it really does give us that opportunity to become really creative, give people options. And um, yeah, like it. it I, I, lots of online funerals are happening right now. I've attended a couple and people who live in Europe and England wouldn't have been able to come over for this funeral in a regular day. And I'm seeing lots of long lost family members attending funerals that they probably wouldn't have. Um, so uh, there are some 
definitely some gems in this dark, dark time. Yeah, I think that's super meaningful. It's a really great story that you shared. Um, so Cindy, uh, how can families commemorate the passing of a loved one who is not religious, but accommodate the members of the family that might be? I, uh, yeah, it, it, it can be a challenge. And it, honestly, it's one that I have in my own family. And, and so my, my mother who is, um, is religious and she, she's not, she just has a different view than we have. And so we've made plans. She's told us what she wants. My family's all been very, very open about death and about what, what, what everybody wants and sort of how we want this to happen. And so we have conversations about it. Um, and what we have determined with my mom in particular is that she, she will absolutely get what she wants. She's decided and she's sort of said what she wants. And that part of that is going to involve a, 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 a church um, service. But then she we had the conversation about what makes sense for us and the way that we would like to celebrate her life, which is a very a more personal way. And so we've made plans with her on how to do that. I think it's the communication with the family. And so if you can honestly say, you know, and this is part of the planning, right? So this is part of the discussion and part of the planning. If you can honestly say in advance, you know, I love you and this is the way that I would like to commemorate you, commemorate your life. Um, then those conversations, then it can be easier if you're comfortable having those conversations. But I will say that the challenge is finding the right time to have those conversations, right? So it's not something where you just wanna leap in and slam it down and say, look, this is what I want you to do, but everybody needs to give a little bit. Um, there are some that say, well, after you're gone, it won't matter you're not going to be here. So, you know, we'll do whatever we want. But I think that there's a level of um, respect and compassion for the individual that has to be acknowledged. And, and again, it's not, it's not always easy and we don't always get what we want. It's death is much like life, right? We don't, we don't always get what we want. Um, and so I, I think that combining, so just going back to the specific question, I think combining those two things, combining the piece that um, for our circumstances, my mother wants, but then also can, bringing in the part that we think is going to be really meaningful, which is, you know, a little bit more of a of a celebration of her that's very personal. It will be very personal. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's very great to like hear a very personal perspective on that. Um, so Jen, uh, what types of emotional support are present for non-religious families? Or we're not for non-religious people? Well, there's all sorts of emotional supports out there that are uh, non-denominational. Um, you can find those through, uh, the biggest place where I, I would send clients to have a look uh, is the BC Bereavement Line, which uh, has lots of resources. Also looking at BC 211, they, have, they are a very underutilized resource, but it does have lots of grief and bereavement uh, supports there. Um, yeah, I don't know much more to say about that one. <laughs> I, I, there's something, there's, I, I, Jennifer, there's something that um, uh, I, I've become aware of through uh, this app and I actually used it for a friend of mine um, and it's called Grief Coach. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Grief Coach, right? And sort of this, um, uh, this ongoing support helping you it can help you if you've lost someone, but also in the way that I use it, I use it for my best friend who lost her mother, uh, her brother, and her brother-in-law in a very, very short period of time. And I didn't know how to support her. And I thought, I actually, I need support to be a support. And so we signed up for that app. And um, I think it, it's, that's another way that things are changing and the way we're using technology in different ways to support people. So... Yeah, yeah, thanks. I forgot about that one, but there's a couple of different apps that that uh, you can use. But Grief Coach, it, what it does is it teach it, it reminds you to check in on your friend, yeah, and, and what to say and what not to say. So, um, yeah, yeah, that sounds like a really great resource. Speaking of resources, Cindy, would you like to tell us about the Already to Go kit and why the Memorial Society of BC created it? 
Uh, I, I would love to tell I would love to tell you about it because I think it's a, a really, really good resource. And it was a collaborative effort. There are other people in the community that that helped with that for sure and that provided the initial um, kind of impetus to get it, it going. Um, and uh, I just want to sort of give credit where credit's due. It's all about planning. And sometimes when you go and you approach it and you say, well, I don't know where to start and I don't know what to do. The All Ready to Go um, kit is really meant to give you the, the, the groundwork, the foundational pieces for your planning and how you can get everything in order. So things like where are all your bank accounts? Where is your will? Those are, those are sort of basic pieces. But then other things like, you know, do you, do you want certain things to happen? after you go with your, you're going to put most of this in your will, but you may have other things that you want to have uh, directed in certain ways. You might have in the binder, you might have um, your advanced directive, you might have um, anything, anything that will help when you go. And so this binder is something that was created with the idea that if we give people the tools to start and, and give them a place to start, then they're going to create this for themselves. It's going to be a support for the family because when you work through the binder, you're going to be able to talk to the rest of your family about it as you're creating it. And so the idea is, again, to support not only the person who um, passes, but also the family that's left behind, the family and the friends perhaps that are left behind. And to give people a place to start and that people will add to it as they want to add to it. And if you give me a minute, I'll, I'll walk through sort of the, um, the, the different pieces, the different pieces of it. So if you want to go, I'll, can, can we come back to that in a minute? Because you can, and anybody who wants to uh, learn a little bit more about it can go to our website and take a look at it on the website. Yeah. Do you want me to come back to you after the next question for Jennifer? Yes, please. Okay. That would be great. Perfect. Um, so Jennifer, uh, as an end of life doula, what do you consider the most important part of your role in the end of someone's life? That's a great question. And most people would say that it is to provide vigiling support, which is, is um, untrue. I hardly ever get called into vigil, actually. Uh, I think that initiating the conversations and pre-planning and letting people know their options and educating them are very important. The biggest thing that I do is I listen. And I listen very mindfully and intently. I set my intentions um, that I'm there to listen to them because it is proven and it's theorized and it's written about that people need witnessing. People need to know that they've been seen and heard. And they need to know that, that um, someone hears what they're going through. Uh, they, they're sitting with them with their struggles. They're sitting with them with their fears, their grief, their guilt, and um, just being able to, to hold that on with them for a little while. And then making sure that I do lots of self-care and, and making sure I have some boundaries about what pieces of that I want to bring home. Um, because you really don't want to bring uh, that home. It can, people think all the time that this is a really hard job. It has to be depressing. Oh, I, I wouldn't be able to do that work, but this is the most empowering and rewarding job that I have ever had. And um, yeah, yeah, if you do it well and you don't take all the sorrow home and you see those golden nuggets and you're able to assist uh, people into having and creating those uh, beautiful moments, then, then you've done a good job. And I always say that if I don't get called into vigil, I've done a good job as well, because that way I know that the family feels that they're prepared to do it for them, because I think it would be way more meaningful to have a family member or a friend there and in the end supporting them than, than my, myself. But um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's very great thing to hear. Um, so Cindy, do you had something you wanted to I, touch on? 
I, I, did, I just wanted to walk through sort of the different sections. So there's 12 sections in the binder. And this would just give people an idea of the kinds of things. And even if you sort of for yourself want to think about, okay, what are the pieces I should gather together to help, um, to help my family and then have this in a place where uh, it's easily accessible. So last will and testament, power of attorney, uh, representation agreement, advanced care directives, uh, Memorial Society funeral arrangement um, form, the celebration of life plan, life insurance policy, uh, and the recap of life insurance policies. Uh, if, if in fact it is going to be a death in the home, then expected letter of death in the home. People to call list, this is really important. Sometimes you don't think about it, but people to call. So who do you want, who do you want to know if you do have family, you know, far away or old friends, maybe. It's really good to have them on the list. A list of financial holdings, super helpful. Um, copies of personal identification. And then the last piece is a last reviewed record. And this is just the record of when the all ready to go binder was reviewed so that people know that it's been looked at, like how, how recently was it looked at? Because of course, if we go through major life changes, maybe something needs to be updated, um, but it's really good to know when it was last reviewed. And then the goal would be to keep this um, in a place uh, where it's easily accessible. And one of the suggestions that we have is you could uh, somehow, you know, you could put a note, you know, in your, the green sleeve that you have on your fridge um, that has, if it's, you have DNR orders and advanced care directives and that sort of thing. Uh, if you have one of those on the fridge, you could leave a note in there about where to find the all ready to go binder as well. Um, and we have, we have those available at our office and can send them out as well. So that's the kind of thing that you would want to be thinking about. And that's the, where the, the all ready to go binder gets you kind of thinking about these pieces and pulling them together. And if there is any anxiety around being prepared, it really helps to have something like this, right? You, you, you do definitely feel empowered and, and, and it does make a difference really. And, and for the family too. Yeah, definitely. I do have a question for you as well, Cindy. Um, so how can people protect themselves and their families from financial burdens related to the end of their lives? Mm, plan in advance, plan in advance. We are, we are huge proponents of uh, uh, sort of pre-arranging, pre-planning. We are not big fans of pre-paying. So uh, one of the main reasons for that is because you're not around to make sure you get what you paid for, right? Things change and you don't necessarily, I think it's uh, the number of, for pre prepayment uh, to funeral uh, homes for services, I think something like 20% of all of them go unclaimed. And we're talking, this is a multi-billion dollar industry, right? Um, so, but for the, from a, a personal perspective, make sure that you let everyone know what you want in the way, like through your all ready to go binder, through conversations with your family, you know, write it down, whatever it happens to be, become a member of the society. We will put that, we will take your, your arrangement. Um, we have an arrangement form. You can put what you want on the form. We'll keep that on file um, and, and be really clear about what it is that you want. If you want, a, you know, the basic cremation, then, then have that and communicate, communicate, plan. It can be a huge burden. Part of the um, challenge of the death, uh, the industry itself is that it's a sales, it's a sales um, uh, machine. And so if you, if you think about the most vulnerable times in your life, well, one of them is when you are grieving, right? And so, in order to protect our families, uh, I think the planning is the most important thing. Again, let people know what it is you want. Be really clear about it. Um, the society, what we do is we contract and we contract with um, independent uh, service providers and we ensure that they are compassionate and ethical and that they provide good pricing for our members as well. So that's part of the services that we provide. So not only will we keep what you want on file, but when the time comes and, and the call is made to the Memorial Society because someone's a member, 
what we actually do is direct you to the service provider in your area that the Memorial Society is contracted with, and they give preferential pricing to members. That was a long, sorry, that was a really, really long answer. No, that was a really, really thorough answer as well. I think that was really well done. I just wanted to add on to that. Uh, shop around because you don't have to use the funeral home. If if you, just saying, if you don't go with Memorial Society, sorry, <laughs> they, they, they can, there's a plug for you here. Um, but if you don't shop around, you do not have to use the funeral home in your area, the one that everybody's always used. Uh, find one that is upfront that posts their costs on their website in BC. It is they are legally bound to give you all their prices up front. They are not allowed to upsell uh, on the floor. Um, you know, this is wouldn't you want the best for your mom or, or whoever? Yeah. Um, they're not they're not allowed to play on your emotions, but uh, just just make sure that you do go with a funeral provider that you are comfortable with. There are so many great ones in the lower mainland um, that that um, yeah, I would go and talk to three of them, but don't talk to three of them at the time of death. Talk to them yes. now. <laughs> yeah, and and I totally agree with that. And I think it goes goes back to the sort of educating yourself and figuring out you know what you're comfortable with, and you will learn something as you go through the process. You will learn something. You either learn that there's something you really don't want to do or you may discover that there's something that you really do want to do, but it is absolutely 100% shop around, yeah. Or be a member, yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a good point to price compare. Um, and so we have a question for Sophie. Um, so can you speak to the significance of uh, the recent legislation passed by referendum in uh, New Zealand on medical assistance in dying and also the proposed bill that is in front of parliament right now? Just like mm -hmm. the importance of it. Yeah, so the humanist perspective of it is really that these are bills and any time in the world that someone gains a little bit more autonomy, a little bit more choice about their end of life care, that is a good thing. Um, it's also a really compassionate response to suffering and compassionate response uh, to people's desire to be able to control what happens to them at their end of life, because it's a really scary thing. It also offers a lot of comfort to people who may be experiencing a lot of pain uh, with a chronic disease or a degenerative disease that they know that that option will be there for them at their end of life. So those are two really positive things that humanists can hold and remember. And in New Zealand, it really goes to show that uh, even though medical assistance in dying is a very new thing and um, only available to a very small amount of people around the world, uh, the conversation is growing. And even if more countries aren't legalizing it, which uh, the BCHA would hope is being done, but even if that isn't happening, the conversation is growing. And even just those little news articles being sent out around the world that New Zealand is legalizing it really makes people think about their own end of life and how they can plan for that. Totally. So we have a question that was submitted via email before the event, um, and any of our speakers can jump in to answer this, uh, whoever feels like they have something to say. So the question is, how can we open the discussion of death and why it's important that we do talk about it? Um, and why is it important that we get comfortable talking about death? Wow, well, because it's not going anywhere, right? Like, I think that I think it, I think it the more that we talk about it, the more that we accept it. I really loved how Jennifer framed the potential for, I don't know, I don't know if you use the word acceptance, but I heard kind of beauty in passing it. And, and to me that, I guess it indicates some kind of acceptance as well. And so for our own peaceful purposes as, as human beings, I think it's a, an important conversation to have and to also to look after one another. It's a way of looking after one another. Yeah, definitely um, the language that we use around death and dying and using the real words helps people get comfortable. I don't like to say you've lost someone or someone's past. Use the real words and, and open the conversations organically. So right now we're in this perfect position with COVID to have open conversations about death and dying. Uh, when medical assistance in dying came out, that was a perfect time to have conversations about end of life and death and dying. 
um, and doing it so that we're framing it in a way that isn't all ugly and yucky and you know in the ER or in, in in the ICU full of tubes and needles and things it doesn't have to be like that I have witnessed so many beautiful deaths um, even since COVID um, I've had two clients of mine use medical assistance in dying since COVID so the program is still running um, one example like I said, I'm full of stories and I love to still tell stories and, and I always get permission, but I, but I had a client who, who died in, um, in a park in Vancouver, next to the river, surrounded by six friends, social distanced, um, uh, in the wilderness. And that was able to happen because the parks were closed at the time, actually, and the city allowed for uh, the, the, that to happen there. And that was a, a, a beautiful event for, for this person. Um, so yeah, you, using, using these natural organic times. I always tell people when they're coming through uh, my program, tell people that you're taking the program, let them think that you're crazy, you know, uh, get the conversation started. It doesn't matter why it starts. It matters that it has started. Absolutely. Um, so one more question before we switch into the questions that have been submitted by everyone here today. Uh, so besides those already mentioned, what are some resources that you've liked on this subject of end of life? And is there anyone doing work in this field that inspires you or is there work you'd like to see? So I, I would I would say there's a couple of books I think that are really important and coming at it from the perspective of, you know, consumer advocacy organization who's looking at end of life and, and, and death and dying uh, and how can we support people to make sort of good decisions. There's a couple of books that I think are amazing just to talk about the, the, the history of um, uh, funeral planning. And this, I'm going to hold it up because I brought it with me, but it's um, uh, Doug Smith, The Big Death. And, and I, I learned so much. I learned so much from that book and it gave me a really good, I even learned about the society actually because we're in there and it talks about the history with the Unitarian Church and um, how all these things came about. So for me, that history and understanding that in my role at the organization, at the society is really, really important. Um, it's, it's maybe, it's less about, um, it's less about supporting on death, death and dying. I think I already mentioned um, I, I already mentioned the death, uh, death coach and, or sorry, grief coach. Uh, but I, I think that the education side of things, if I, if I have any more and think of any more, I'll certainly share them. But for me, that was a really interesting one just around the history of funerals and funeral planning, right? And why we sometimes feel forced to, or forced to, sometimes we make the decisions um, automatically without thinking about them when we can give them some thought now. Yeah, uh, this whole bookshelf behind me are all books on death and dying. And I would, I don't know, I'm thinking, oh, which one should I pull? And because there's so many great books out there. My favorite book, my mentor uh, in doing this work is Mitch Album, uh, Tuesdays with Maury. That was a book that really got me going into being a doula. And uh, it's an old one. There's lots of great old books. Most of the, my favorite books that are on that shelf are from the 1970s and they are still relevant today. Ram Dass, you know, uh, Patch Adams. Those books are still relevant and they're still there and it's about human kindness and taking care of each other and compassion. Um, and I think that that's, that are, that are, are the, the biggest things that we need in today and, and they don't, that doesn't get old. Um, for resources, I'm just thinking because we're on the internet more, my favorite resource still is the Government of BC website. And I'm not, I, you know, it is great. It's www.gov.bc.ca and you can type anything in there. Uh, you know, funeral expenses, bereavement leave, um, caregiver leave home care, 
um, funeral planning, estate planning, anything that you want, you can find on that government website. We have done a fantastic job here in BC of organizing all of the information and putting it on one website. Um, I, and I'm always about getting the information from the horse's mouth. Like you really do want to get it from the people who are going to provide the service. So the government websites, the health authority websites, um, really make sure that you get your, your, um, your information from the correct website. I mean, it's great to read a book that, you know, makes you feel good, but then you realize that the book was written in the UK and those things aren't actually happening here. So look at, look what you've got right in front of you and, and utilize them. Yeah, I totally, and I totally agree with that. We've got links to all sorts of different things on our website, just, and it's loads of government. And it's exactly, that's exactly it, right? If you want the source, if you want, just go to the source, right? And there's lots of information that you wouldn't necessarily think that you might find there, but that search is that really, really good option. But who thinks to go, to go to the government website for grief and bereavement resources? Like seriously, yeah. yeah. But but there's so much on there, so much. Mm -hmm. I would also add that uh, I really look forward to as this conversation evolves and opens. I hope that we receive and we facilitate more discussions about cross cultural perspectives on death. And uh, there's been a little bit of integration of indigenous perspectives and elder circles in consultations for medical assistance and dying. But I'm very curious to see how that changes with new legislation and also in New Zealand uh, with the Maori people and how that engagement comes into play. And I think Canada is a multicultural society. It's very interesting and very important to learn about how other people see death um, and how other people see uh, the choice to die through an assisted death. And I think as we gather that information and we integrate it into our perspectives, uh, it's a very important um, piece of it. And also, um, I'll also just this book right here, The Little Book of Humanism uh, by Andrew Copson, who's the, and Alice Roberts, the presidents of uh, Humanist UK and Humanist International, have a fantastic section in this book, um, talking a little bit about uh, what it means to be humanist and think about your death important it is to think about your mortality. And I just really love uh, a few of the poems and a few of the sections. And um, I think that we also have a few quotes from that in the audiobook section as well of the end of life guide and the memorials and grief guide. Yeah. And just to add to that, uh, Living My Culture is a great mm -hmm. uh, resource for looking at different cultures and different cultural aspects. And they've just added uh, one for Indigenous people. It's called Circle of Care. Um, there is actually an Indigenous end of life guide. And uh, I've had the honor to go into uh, 40, 41 different reserves around BC and have trained well over 100 uh, community members and how to take care of their own loved ones at home the way they want um, and and it's just a fantastic thing it's my it, that's my heart work is working in uh, First Nations communities with uh, Douglas College and FNHA's partnership to bring this uh, education to community members so there is some great resources out there there's also some great uh, BIPOC and LGBTQ plus two plus plus uh, resources for um, people who um, who might experience death a little bit different. I remember I, I had a client who had trans uh, transformed or trans transitioned transitioned transformed is a different word uh transitioned and the family around them didn't know that and there was going to be a lot of conversations around that so it was really interesting uh time and it's really important to to remember that we need to support everyone and love everyone well no matter where they're at i'll also add that there are specific um lgbtq uh, death planning workshops in Vancouver, um, put on by Krista Ovenel, um, and those are really interesting for people living from that perspective uh, and wanting to integrate partners um, into their experience or adopted children or just have a different perspective of death and a different experience about living with their family and having their own perspectives be integrated into that and in parts of themselves. Yeah.
Thank you guys. That's a very comprehensive uh, amount of resources. And I think everyone watching definitely has a lot to take away from that. Um, so our first question uh, submitted in the chat is from Alex and it's for Cindy. Um, so Alex says, do you have a peer grief support group for individuals who have gone through a family death? Is there something specifically for families who have gone through a maid death? Uh, so, so for our, what we do is we go up until the, we were talking about this um, earlier, I think, uh, uh, when we were talking about this panel is sort of the different places where organizations come in. And so for us, we are there until uh, the point of death. Uh, beyond that, we don't have, we don't provide services and we don't have a role. So we are the, we are the planning we are the leading up to and supporting people and helping them make the decisions and, and sort of uh, uh, financial decisions and, and consumer decisions. But beyond that, that's not sort of our, our area of expertise. So I, I don't have anything to offer you, Alex, I'm sorry. But I bet somebody else here does. Well, I think I mentioned uh, the, the group Bridge C14, and maybe Sophie or Emily can share that with the group later. And that is a support group just for uh, family members who have had someone die uh, uh, from med by medical assistance and dying. Um, we, we, you know, Cindy and I are both still beating the drum about planning. And that's something that I ask families before uh, the death has even occurred is I, I asked them what kind of supports have you used in the past and what worked because sometimes going to a support group didn't work you know that that type of support didn't work maybe one-on-one -on -one doesn't work maybe um, you know really thinking about those things in advance and identifying those and, and even making that list beforehand so that when they need to reach out uh, that's already available. And as a doula myself, I always ask everybody, uh, I, I, I encourage all of my doulas to check and make sure that that resource is relevant and still around because if that person's got the energy up to reach out for help and they call the hospice or wherever they call and that grief group doesn't exist anymore, that person could become very defeated and may not reach out to anyone else. So do your research before and think about what's worked, what's not worked, and uh, really um, make sure that it's unique to that person that's going to that it, they're going to that it's going to support. Um, yeah, I think those are both very good answers. So uh, our next question is from Murray, and I think probably to Sophie, but to anyone who wants to answer. Um, so what are potential changes to dying with dignity provisions in the future in regards to people with Alzheimer's? Mm, that is a, that's a really fantastic question. Um, definitely not something that I can speak to directly. Um, it's, it's very complicated because there is a, a high bar for a capacity to consent. Um, now, the way that it would have to work would be someone before they were unable to consent would have to have an advanced directive saying that as part of their um, care plan, they wish to make uh, medical assistance and dying part of their end of life. Now that can be reversed in many different ways uh, by the person's choice or if the doctors believe it's no longer um, an option or the best option for this person. So it's very tricky because a lot of people die with some level of dementia or of Alzheimer's, and that's just not something, unfortunately, that can be clarified right now. Um, it's a really great question, and I think about it a lot because I wish that I could uh, offer it or um, provide more education on that because it's it causes so much stress and so much grief for people. But uh, the very short answer right now is that it's unfortunately just not on the table if someone is already living with Alzheimer's. Did anybody else would like want to speak to that at all or? No, okay, we'll move on. Um, so Eric asks, uh, I'm curious about green burials. How long does it take for a body to return to the earth? And afterwards, does this mean that the space is available for another green burial? Uh, I'm thinking of specific sites like the one in Victoria that provides an area for green burials. I'm not sure if anyone's expertise speaks to this, but um, do, does anyone like have any thoughts on this question? I, I wish I had the specific answers to that because I think it's really interesting and I think it'll become more and more 
uh, interesting for people. If I remember, I've done a little bit of reading on it. And if I remember correctly, there is actually a certain amount of time uh, up until the point where you would be able to put another body in, but I don't have the specifics. I think it's really, there's so many interesting things to be looking at, sort of fat, um, uh, you know, uh, composting, acclimation, those things that I mentioned before um, that we would like to, the society would like to do more research on and provide more information about. So that's part of the, our role is educating and hopefully we'll be able to do that. Yeah, so I, I think there's a little bit of a difference between composting and, and a green burial. And uh, what you're what you're saying, Eric, I think it leans a little bit more towards the the human composting, which is legal in uni, uh, United States in Washington, which is closer than some of the cremations that you would have if you live closer to Surrey or White Rock, uh, where most cremations happen uh, in uh, Squamish and Maple Ridge, and people don't realize that. Um, so it might be faster for you to go across the board, uh, across the border, but uh, it is legal now in Washington state and human composting, they, they do accelerate the breakdown because of the organic matter that is added. So there is a quicker time frame where um, they would put someone on top. And basically once that all works its way down, the family has the option to take some of that organic material home. I'm not sure about getting it across the border. Um, I know you can get yourself across the border, whether you have a passport or not. So sometimes that's a fun little kick in the pants. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to go across the border these days. Um, but that is something that's definitely viable for people in uh, British Columbia because of the access to the Washington. Um, so for green burial, there, there's five principles of a green burial if you're not sure. Uh, number one is no embalming. Number two is direct uh, burial to the earth. Number three is ecological preservation and conservation. So they need to use this uh, area to grow things that would in, have happened indigenously. So they're growing and they're using this land. They're uh, really utilizing it. And, and, and number, number four is communal memorialization. So it is used as a park. It is used as something else. You're not walking through there um, that, you know, there's a stone or a bench with names and whatnot. And then optimize land use. So for example, if you go down to Heritage Gardens, the parts of the, the green burial section that they have down there, they're farming it right now because they want to use the land. Um, as for breakdown, breakdown in each person is different because you can have a person go from full, full body to skeleton in 12 days in the right condition. Um, but in a, a different condition, it could take months or even years. I mean, you got to think about things. If it's a hot, balmy 42 degrees in downtown Vancouver and you're uh, in a green burial, you're going to break down a lot quicker than if you were buried in February. So, it, and it depends on what you were dying from or how long you've been, you've been dying, what medication you were using. So, so many factors. That's my little two cents on the whole thing. Um, totally into composting. I would love to be composted. Alkaline hydrolysis is cremation by water and it's not going to happen in BC anytime soon. Uh, it is legal in different provinces, but if you're flying your body to another province to use uh, alkaline hydrolysis, you're probably doing it for environmental reasons. What well, you should probably look at the fossil fuels that are being used to fly you over there. Um, but uh, I, I just taught about burials yesterday. So I'm up on my information and I have my resources right next to me. So there you go. All right, yeah. Uh, we, our next question is a question um, from Patricia and she shares a very personal uh, message. So first she asks, how can she become involved in the advanced directive advocacy for MAID? Um, and she shares that her husband had brain cancer so he's exempt from being able to choose MAID. join an advocacy group like Dying with Dignity. That, that would be my, um, my suggestion. 
and I'm sorry about your uh, your husband, Patricia. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think she sent a different question to Sophie. Would you like to say that now, Sophie? Patricia asked a, <coughs> a fabulous question, um, talking about how do humanists fit into grief support groups where uh, many people might be religious? Um, and I choose to use the word religious because uh, some humanists feel that they are spiritual and some humanists feel that they are not. Um, and spiritual can just refer to your relationship with um, something greater than you. So uh, in my case, I would identify as spiritual, but that I feel spiritual with <clears throat> the nature that lives around me and interacting with science and interacting with nature and uh, wild animals and feeling that as a part of me and a part of um, my life on this earth. So I would encourage her to explore uh, groups like Grief Beyond Belief who are really fabulous. Um, and there's a, there's a little bit of a blurb about them um, in the Grief and Memorials Guide. Uh, it's very tricky to start um, your own group, uh, but I would absolutely encourage you to do so. Facebook groups are a really great resource. Um, and also Reddit pages are also really great. So Reddit pages, Reddit is a social media site um, where anyone can post and provide lots of support. So uh, the humanist Reddit is quite good. Um, and I believe that Grief Beyond Belief also has one as well. So definitely check out our memorials and grief guide. Obviously those are all free on our website, provides a little bit more information about emotional support. Another uh, person to chat to is a non-religious pastoral carer, which is a very interesting field uh, within humanism. And those people can talk a lot about uh, death and giving people's relationships with it from a secular perspective and helping you really explore your own identity with that. Um, and there's so much diversity in humanism uh, of beliefs that really delving into how you feel about that is so important. Absolutely. Does anyone want to speak to uh, Patricia's question other than Sophie? No? All right. Uh, so our next question is from Barry, uh, she says for Jennifer, but if anyone afterward would like to speak to it as well, floor is open. Um, so she says, as an end of life doula, how do you provide support for a person who is unable to communicate effectively through disability? For example, Parkinson's sufferers, sufferers cannot speak audibly. People with damaged vocal cords uh, through inept insertion of stomach tubes are unable to speak. Both of these experiences are personal family, or sorry, both of these examples are personal family experiences. Communication is not just words. Uh, you can communicate with uh, the way you look at someone. I can hold space for someone by simply um, holding eye contact with them. I have had clients who were competent and cognitive because that is key. Once uh, a person that I'm supporting becomes uh, unable to make their own medical decisions, I support their, I still support them, but I support them uh, by supporting their family and their uh, representative, whoever they deem that to be in their advanced care plan. But I have had clients who have lost their ability to speak, um, but still had competency. And we were very creative with, you know, uh, iPads with a, or with, through email. I had uh, one man who wore uh, an eye reader so he could he could type words with his, it was like so fascinating, this technology. Um, he could send me an email just by using his eyes. Um, so there are other options for being able to support someone as long as there's competency. And if, and um, and I think I think um, yeah, technology is just fascinating for this stuff. There's so many great uh, great resources. And I have had clients who were deaf or hard of hearing, and I have had I have. Um, three uh, uh, ASL uh, doulas as well. And I have doulas who speak a different language because sometimes there's a language barrier. Um, so there's there's options. That's really awesome, like accessibility that you have ASL and bilingual doulas. Um, but yeah, our next question is for everyone. Um, so it's from Jurgen who asks, would, what would you, Cindy and Jennifer, do if a person came to you and said that they wanted your support to die peacefully and pain, painlessly, 
but like most today in Canada looking for that, we're not eligible for MAID. I, I think, I mean, as a, the setting aside the role of the society, right, because that's not, that's, that wouldn't be something that we would support people around. It's just not our, our, our mandate, it's not um, our mission. Um, if you will, but I think that what I, I what I would do personally is I think that I would um, try to I'd probably try to connect with someone like Jennifer um, to have the conversation about what what are what are the possibilities, what can we do, and then seek guidance around um, learning more, uh, getting more education again, and and trying to learn as much as possible so that. I can, I would want to support the person. I mean, that would be my goal, be to support the person in the best way possible. Um, but I speak to that as a, as a human being, as opposed to sort of on the society's behalf, right? Yeah, thanks Jorgen for that question. Um, first thing I would ask you is, do you know what the role of a doula is? Because I have been asked to participate in things that would not be legal uh, here in BC. And I have to make sure that I stay in my scope of practice because of my position and because that's the right thing to do. So I don't do any harm. I will not assist you in any of that if that's what you're asking, if, you know. But what I would ask you is, I'm looking at you not in the camera now, so. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what I would ask is, what does that mean for you? What does it mean to to die peacefully? And uh, what would what would your gold star death be? Um, and how can we help you achieve that if you're not eligible for medical assistance in dying? Can we still get a level? Uh, you know, get on some sort of level with that? Can we uh, help you to achieve some of that? And what are your expectations of, of, of me? Um, because I, I do have clients who, who would, I do have one client right now who would love nothing more than to be eligible for medical assistance and dying. And they're, and they're quite, they're not. Um, you're, you're right in that some medical diseases uh, are not qualifiers for medical assistance and dying. Age is not a, a qualifier for medical assistance and dying. Um, so we sit with that and we, we, be, we get on a, a level where we're okay with where we're at. Um, yeah. Thanks. I, I hope I helped a little bit, but uh, we're not going to go down by the river and do anything <laughs> illegal. I would also add just to what Jennifer said. I think that's a, that's a perfect answer is exploring what um, why they want that experience for their end of life and uh, does it mean that they choose uh, to die with their family and friends and they believe that that's an important component or is it because they really want control over the situation or what is it that's attractive to them about an assisted death and about that wish for themselves and trying to integrate that into their own experience. So, you know, making sure that they're never alone and having family at every moment or having someone where the whole time um, until they pass away peacefully or really designing that space for themselves um, in a way that uh, is comforting um, and that could uh, offer them some control over it. Because often uh, we all want to have that autonomy and to be able to express that. And there is absolutely a way to still be able to have that autonomy and enact that even if you're not receiving an assistant death. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great add on to, to what I said, Sophie. <laughs> way better than going down by the river, I'm sorry. Um, on that note, uh, we have time for just one more question, um, and I'll just wait a second if anyone wants to submit that. But in the meantime, is there anything that I didn't ask you, our speakers, um, that you'd like to mention or speak to before the event is over? I just would like to say that no matter what someone's beliefs are, whether they're humanist, Christian, um, atheist, LGBTQ, you know, what culture they come from. I, our approach as doulas is that we meet the person where they're at um, and we can support anyone. Uh, I've had numerous clients that have had different backgrounds than myself. And um, it's really fascinating to find out what that means to them and being able to walk that walk with them 
even though we might not share the same beliefs. So mm -hmm. that's that's just something I just wanted to share. And I and I think that's really I think that's really lovely and comes from the same perspective that we do is we want to figure out you know how can we how can we um, do our work in a way that supports everybody regardless of where they're coming from regardless of what their backgrounds might be what their experience might be what does that look like and yet we're doing it in a you know sort of in a very different way and coming at it from someplace different but there are all these pieces of this puzzle that fit together and that the conversations that we have um, will will hopefully and I think about this Sophie in terms of the public engagement around made and some of the you know culturally who's contributing right who's contributing to these conversations and are the right um, are, are the right people and when I say that I, I don't necessarily mean the professionals I mean the people who it really impacts are we are we hearing are we getting the information that we need to help them and to put the supports in place right regardless of whether it's before leading up to the point of death at death or after death so I, I, I really appreciate being a part of this discussion. I've learned so much. Thank you very much. I mean, I have learned a ton, but it's a, it is an important piece, right? That we have these conversations. I would also just share, just so everyone knows the resources that are available to them through the BCHA and why uh, we're doing this work and what we're providing. So uh, just a few things very briefly that uh, you can check out as you're gathering resources and taking notes and all that. So the BCHA has released the end of life guide. Um, then we're also doing this panel. And then there's also the memorials and grief guide. Um, and both of those are available in audiobook format for people who are unable to read or want to listen to it on Spotify in their drive to work. That's an option. Um, <laughs> it's a fun little podcast. And uh, we'll also be releasing some legislative and government related um, things. So we're submitting a brief uh, to talk about and to advocate on behalf of people receiving um, MAID. And we've also written a blog post recently, just talking a little bit about what the changes um, to the law mean. They're specifically changes to the criminal code, not to Canada Health Act or anything like that. So it is pretty specific. Um, so just a couple of things to remember and just keep informed and uh, check out what we continue to do. Um, we're very proud of it and we're happy uh, for people to be receiving those resources that are very specific to their background and their beliefs. Absolutely. And everything Sophie just mentioned can be found on our website, which is bchumanist.ca. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you everyone so much for coming. Thank you, of course, to our panelists for spending so much of their time diving into such a deep and like, um, like pretty emotionally packed conversation on like a tough topic. Um, really appreciate uh, you sharing your experience with us. Um, and if there's any uh, resources that any of you want to make sure that those watching today have access to like links or anything like that, please definitely feel free to like add them um, on our Facebook page. We usually uh, have these the advertisements for the events. Um, so you could just like add it either on the event page or in one of our posts about the event, just so it's easy for people to find. Um, and anyone interested in future events or other information that we will be sharing in the near future on our medical assistance in dying campaign, you can follow our newspaper or sorry, our newsletter um, on our website. All right, uh, thanks everybody so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.